I am on campus in Logan, Utah State University, and um, help coordinate the integrated pest management program. And I work a lot in the fruits. Um, but uh, Nick and and my goal is to improve the use of IPM and reduce pesticide use. So looking at this picture here, shown on the right, uh, some potatoes. Um, you look at this picture, think, okay, there's some things going on here, and um, a lot of uh, you might think, well, it looks like some IPM is going on here. So if you wanted to take a second and type in ch into chat um, what you think uh, is, you know, would be an IPM practice implemented here. There's some, you know, white stuff on the surface of the leaves. There's a little fence around the edge, some onions. So I don't, you know, you can make your own mind if you think this is integrated pest management practice here. And then we can look at that later. All right, so I figured I'd talk about earwigs, leaf miners, and grasshoppers. And go ahead and start with uh, with uh, earwigs. So a comment came through, looks like seven, but I will uh, go ahead and say that that is actually a product uh, called kaolin clay. So you can buy it um, at IFA or farm stores, it's called surround, and it acts like a repellent. So in this case, they're trying to repel flea beetles. All right, so earwigs. Uh, I wanted to talk about that because the populations have been pretty high this year. Um, and, and most vegetable farmers have to deal with earwigs every year. Uh, but when you think about the earwig, it has a pretty diverse diet. In fact, it's omnivorous, okay? And um, looking through soils with a lot of organic matter or mulch, you're going to find earwigs in those locations because they're helping to decompose uh, that uh, organic matter. So that's, you know, one of the benefits, I guess you could say, of the earwigs. But they're also uh, predators. So they feed on other insects as well, and sometimes on insect pests. So you can see here, this earwig has grabbed a caterpillar feeding on that. And there's actually been studies um, in various locations. This this study here showing the video is out of Washington State University, and it isn't a fruit uh, crop, apples, but they were studying earwigs as a biological control for this pest called woolly apple aphid. And so this earwig was munching through a woolly apple aphid colony overnight, and by the next day that colony was eliminated. Um, so in Australia, they actually use earwigs um, for uh, a beneficial to take care of certain pests. So, but in the vegetable garden, this is kind of what we see um, when we think of earwigs is uh, issues on the crop. You know, especially if you're dealing with leafy greens, um, you don't want earwigs around. So their feeding is kind of uh, leaves behind these ragged leaves where sometimes they may chew and consume the entire leaf. They may chew the veins, they may leave the veins of the leaves. So it's a real random uh, feeding pattern. Potato on the left, and if you want to grow basil, it's very difficult because earwigs just flock to basil. And so looking at your plants with a headlamp out at night, uh, this is what you might see. You rarely will see them out active during the day feeding. Um, but they are jumping away in pretty high numbers, like I said. So you may uh, recognize earwigs by their feeding. Um, you may find the earwigs or you may find uh, their poop or their frass. So it's these little black specks. And uh, the frass actually has uh, a scent or a pheromone in it that is attractive to other earwigs. So it's kind of an aggregation pheromone. So that's in some ways how they tend to feed in these large groups together. On the right there is uh, some damage due to a peach. So there are fruit pests as well, not just vegetable pests. Okay, so in any time you're um, trying to deal with a, a pest or managing, you want to understand its biology. 
and um, earwigs are a little interesting in that way. Um, so they overwinter as adults in protected areas. And very early in the spring, March, or maybe even earlier than that, um, they'll mate. And then the females will um, dig a little burrow and lay her eggs, um, maybe around 60 or so eggs in a, in a big group. And she will tend to those eggs. Um, she'll move them around. She'll flatten them out so that they don't get any kind of mold growing on them. They're kept nice and clean. And even when they hatch uh, the nymphs, she will take care of the nymphs as well. And this is a really rare occurrence among insects. Um, definitely one of the few insect uh, females that will tend to the young. So as the nymphs uh, grow, they'll change in color from this cream color to a little bit more of a, a brownish color. And I do want to point out the little um, uh, claspers at the end of her body are called Circe, and they are used for um, defensive measures. So she'll stick them up or um, use them as a way to, to scare others away, including the males. She does not want the males around either. Um, and she also may use them to grasp prey as well. So eventually this, these nymphs will leave and then start feeding on their own. Um, and so this, I'm not going to go over this whole diagram here, but it just shows a general life cycle in terms of the fact that earwigs only have one generation per year. Uh, so those eggs that were laid in uh, March or so and emerge, we'll start to see the nymphs emerging around May. They'll grow and develop all season long to the end of the season, and then they overwinter again as adults. So as far as managing these in uh, the vegetable garden or on the farm, there's kind of three uh, main practices you could implement, trapping, exclusion, or insecticides. And of these, um, trapping is the most labor intensive, but it's gonna give the best results. Um, especially if you are diligent and um, able to stick with it over a long period of time. I do know people who have had high populations, worked um, carefully with the trapping and have been able to lower their earwigs um, on the farm for years ahead. So I'll talk about each one of those. So trapping, a couple of options. One in this video that this is Diane Alston is showing the use of uh, rolled up corrugated cardboard. So they're just cutting these sections about four inches wide or however wide you want, rolled up tight. And in this case, she's attaching them to a tree because I mentioned they can be a fruit pest, but they can also be placed on the ground as well. And so the earwigs are going to seek shelter within the corrugated cardboard uh, sections during the day. So you would remove those and you could, a couple things you could do, you could shake them out in soapy water, roll it back up and replace it. Or you could just, if you don't want to deal with uh, the actual earwigs themselves, you could just throw the whole thing out and, and put a new one up. And this is where what I meant about it being more labor intensive, it takes more time. So in this example, um, the cardboard roll is hung with up higher within the tree and it's shown that it's perpendicular to the branch. So it would be better to, if it was parallel with the branch where the earwigs can find that shelter easily. So that's one option is the corrugated cardboard. And then the other is just rolled up newspaper. And you could, sit at home one night and roll up a bunch of these newspaper uh, clumps so that you can always have a supply every time you go out uh, in the morning to collect the newspaper and replace it with a new one. And it would be best if it was slightly damp. And that way it's a little bit more attractive to the earwigs to seek shelter within that rolled newspaper. All right, so those are, are a couple of options. And then the other option is actually using um, oil for a bait, like a bait pan. And uh, I did see a, a question come through chat real quick, and that was, when is the best time to gather those, um, the cardboard or the newspapers? So they're gonna seek shelter as soon as light comes about early in the morning. So you can grab it, um, you know, as soon as it's daylight outside, basically. 
and throughout the day, they'll pretty much be hiding in that shelter. All right, so then the other option is okay, um, using oil in these containers. And this, um, uh, again, might be a little bit, take a little bit more time and effort, but is highly effective. Some people use oil alone in the container, and some may mix it and find better results if they mix it with something that's kind of smelly um, soy sauce, bacon grease. A can, a fresh can of tuna, dumping out the the tuna water or the tuna oil into the uh, your little oil pan. So either way, um, you can you can experiment with what what might work best for you. Apple cider vinegar was another example that someone uh, shouted out. Thank you for that. So here's just an example of um, some olive oil. In this case, I think it might be a little bit pricey, but um, put into these containers, set them out uh, at dusk wherever you're, even within the plants too. And then overnight, they will find that oil and crawl to it and uh, essentially back up, be drowned in the oil. And in some cases, this could be hundreds and hundreds of earwigs. And you would continue to do this night after night after night until you uh, don't have any more in that oil pan. So continuing on with this video, um, so these were set on top of the soil surface and it might be a little more effective to slightly bury it uh, amongst the mulch or the soil so that the earwigs can just kind of plop into it. And that's what this person did and um, collected it that morning and has here hundreds in this uh, one overnight trap. And I thought this was an interesting idea. What this person is doing is um, reusing that oil instead of just throwing the whole thing out. So she's putting the earwigs through a sieve and will throw those earwigs away, but then can just reuse this oil and that would be fine. Um, some words of caution is that these little oil pans may attract other mammals like raccoons. So. It's just something that you would need to keep in mind. You wouldn't want to leave it out there. You want to make sure you're collecting it uh, every day. All right, so the um, these types of traps, again, have shown to be quite effective. Um, ants, roly-polies, wasps have been collected in um, some other people's traps in a comment. So can catch more than just um, earwigs. All right, so the other method I mentioned was exclusion. And this is more for um, earwigs that are climbing up into bushes or trees where you want to exclude them from damaging your fruit or, um, or whatever you're, you know, you're growing that on which the earwigs are climbing. So this video is showing the use of duct tape and then Tanglefoot. So Tanglefoot is a uh, material that you can get at um, farm stores and it creates this sticky surface. So here, it's, of course, uh, on a tree. Again, I know this is a vegetable-focused uh, group, but um, it may, this may be applicable. So the duct tape is applied to the tree, and then the tangle foot is applied to the duct tape. And there's those two options that you can buy, a spray option uh, or this thick kind of paste option. And that's put on the duct tape. And then the earwigs are not going to be able to crawl over that sticky surface. Um, as a result, it will probably get dirty, filled with insects. And so you need to reapply the tangle foot um, at least once a week, but it really is going to depend on the site. All right, and finally, management for earwigs, then there are insecticide options. And so there's some organic and some conventional. Spinosad is one option. I know a lot of you are familiar with spinosad, but just in case, it is a, a metabolite from a naturally occurring bacteria in the soil. Uh, so that's why it's considered an organic. And um, it has to be consumed by the earwig for it to work. So it can be applied as a spray or there is a bait and it's called Sluggo Plus. And that could be put around down uh, around your plant. And then the other organic option is just pyrethrin 
um, which has a residual of a couple of days. And conventional, there's you know lots of broad spectrum products, but the one that might work the best is Carbaryl. So that would be applied the foliage and would give about um, 10, 14 days of protection. So that was earwigs, and now I'll move on to the other topic is leaf miners. Mary and I, yes. I have one question from an individual about earwigs. They want to know if they attack ornamental pests as well as with vegetables and fruit. Yes, earwigs can be a big problem on ornamentals. Um, butterfly bush I know is a big one that's very attractive to them. Some herbs um, and and a lot of perennials. So these kind of tactics I mentioned in the vegetable site, uh, fruit site, would be just as effective in the ornamental garden. And who sells sluggo? Um, well, I'll be honest, I got it on uh online i was getting ready to say the company but maybe i should um so you can search for it online um but i'm pretty sure most farm stores might uh have it on hand okay great so moving on to leaf miners um there's a couple of different species one is called beet leaf miner one spinach leaf miner but they're kind of interchangeable on these leafy greens spinach beet chard and they also attack a few uh, weeds as well, like lamb's quarters. But this is where we see them most often uh, in Utah. So again, just a little bit about the biology. Uh, leaf miner, they'll overwinter in the soil as a pupa. And that's what this picture is here. It's on a leaf, but that's what it would look like in the soil, a very tiny little um, pupa. And then in the spring, um, the adults emerge and they just look like flies basically and they lay these bright white eggs on the underside of the leaves and these eggs are actually really easy to spot because they are so white um you can see them with the naked with the your naked eye you don't necessarily need a magnifying lens to see them these eggs will hatch in um anywhere from two to four days so so pretty quickly they'll hatch and then right away, the larvae, which come from those eggs, will uh, mine through the, the leaf itself. And they'll spend um, two weeks or so feeding on that leaf. And then that larva will drop to the ground. And this whole cycle will, will repeat about three times, at least in northern Utah, probably more farther south. So the initial damage is uh going to look pretty similar to the coloration of the, the leaf itself. Nick, you can see the mouse, right? When I move over. Yep, I can see. Okay. So here is some area damaged by leaf miner, still is a, a similar color to the leaf, but as that mined area ages, it gets uh, more of a bleached color and then will become brown or necrotic as we say. And the, the larva that's inside that leaf, so it's feeding between the upper and lower epidermis of the leaf, is shown right there. I've kind of peeled away part of the, the leaf itself and then exposed the larva. So you can see it's a pretty decent size and uh, can cause quite a bit of damage. And they can actually move from leaf to leaf as well. So for managing leaf miners, it um, if you get it right, uh, right timing, right um, uh, planting time, um, you can do almost a pretty good job of avoiding leaf miner without using any um, pesticides. But um, so I mentioned, you know, it's important to know the biology. So it overwinters in the soil. Therefore, if you're planting in the same spot, then the leaf miners will just emerge and affect those plants that have been replanted. And so crop rotation is a big key for leaf miners. They will fly, but at least it's going to help a little bit in reducing the effects on the plants right in the immediate area. But the crop rotation combined with row covers is uh, the best bet if for managing leaf miners and also helping to reduce that population over time. So 
So maybe at some point you wouldn't have to use the row covers on that site. Um, otherwise, it would be really important to uh, continually inspect the leaves of these plants. Again, beets, uh, chard, and spinach. Look for those mines and you can remove the infested leaves and um, uh, again, you're hopefully removing the, the larva that was in that leaf as well. And then maybe if you have time, again, it's labor intensive, but looking for those eggs too. They're easy to spot and crush them as you find them. And then finally, uh, there are a few chemicals available, but they're not that effective because the larvae are, again, inside the leaf. Um, but organic options are, are shown here. This is called azadiractin, and that is based off of the, you're familiar, I'm sure, with neem oil. So it's related to neem oil. And there's some products listed there. It is an insect growth regulator. And so if it's applied right when um, the larvae hatch and maybe they're exposed to the azadiractin, it's going to prevent them from maturing to the next stage. And then pyrethrin is a, another option as well. And then I've listed a few uh, conventional products to pyrethroids and then some others that are a little bit more selective uh, radiant corrigan to uh, certain pests and not quite as um, broad spectrum. All right, so now I'm going to finish up with grasshoppers. And Nick, hopefully, oh, did you have something to say? I have one question from Facebook. So the person is asking, what if you accidentally eat chard with the leaf miner damage? <laughs> So there would be no problem with eating the uh, the damaged leaf, actually eating the, the larva also. <laughs> okay. But yeah, a lot of people eat insects anyway, so um, that would not be harmful at all. Okay. It's tasty. Okay. That's all we have from Facebook. All right, I did want to say, am I good on time? I probably just have a few more minutes. Yep, you're good. Okay. All right, so finishing up then with grasshoppers. Um, this is another pest that in some places of Utah, the numbers are spiking to very, very high numbers. Um, and if you, you could put in chat if you wanted to, if you're having grasshopper issues right now or not. Um, this picture on the left here, that was in my own backyard um, on that uh, mint. And they just chowed down and all kinds of things. So over, over time, I've managed to actually reduce the population to where I'm not really seeing that uh, so much in the last few years. But they have a very wide diet. We'll eat just about anything um, as they grow. So in uh, our area, northern Utah, um, at least in farm areas, there's about four different species that um, we are seeing. Top left, differential grasshopper, banded wing, the top right, migratory grasshopper on the lower left. It's a little bit smaller than um, the differential, which is the largest grasshopper. And then on the lower right is red-legged, and that's one that I actually have never seen, um, but so it might be a little bit more common uh, rangeland settings. Um, but the other three species I've seen in urban settings. Um, let's see, the top one on the top right, banded wing, is one that's going to, the nymphs will come out later, and it will also last much later into the season, into October. So it's one of the ones that will be uh, later. So the problem with having so many different species of grasshoppers is that some hatch early, early, some hatch in the middle of the season, and so you have this uh, continuous cycle of grasshoppers moving through throughout the season. Okay, so the, the life cycle. Um, in the fall, late season, grasshoppers mate and they lay their eggs in the soil. So the, the female uh, digs down in the soil and lays a pretty large clutch of eggs shown here. And uh, Utah Department of Agriculture, they actually go out and do uh, some surveys and they'll dig up some soil in the spring to kind of get an indication of, you know, how many eggs are out there 
what they might be um, seeing and preparing people for the, the coming season. Uh, and they're, they have a pretty simple uh, life cycle or incomplete metamorphosis in that the young nymphs look like the adults, except they don't have wings. So it's about um, five or six instars until the adults develop wings. And the question came through, how deep did they lay their eggs? And so it can be anywhere from two uh, inches or more below the soil surface. Yeah. So it's there, those eggs are really protected. And when they hatch, they're kind of working their way up. And so you may think, oh, you know, winter conditions, are they going to affect the population? Well, because those eggs are so low and protected, not, it's not likely. It's more the spring conditions that affect them. So having said that, grasshoppers go through these uh, cycles of about seven to 10 years where the population will, will spike and then it will crash. It will spike and then it will crash. This is an old graph shown on the left here. Right now, we're in, if we were to assume this was our current year, we're about the peak of a current cycle. So that's why the populations are, are higher now. Um, on the right just shows uh, the United, the Western US in 2006 where blue areas are, are very low infestation, red areas are high. And the, just the point of this is to say that infestations are not equal in all areas. So even in Utah, um, there are some areas where people are not seeing any. And then central Utah, their populations are just incredible. And so there are some folks that are um, in a little bit of a crisis situation. So definitely the population does vary. Uh, but things that may cause the population to crash would be, say, a cool, wet spring. So as those nymphs are coming out of the ground, um, conditions are cool, better environment for fungi or other pathogens to attack them, so they're not able to survive. Something else that may cause the population to decline are um, naturally occurring nematodes as well, which are, are going to attack the, the grasshoppers through the body, reproduce within the grasshopper body, and then emerge. And that emergence of the nematodes from the grasshopper is what kills it. Um, of course, spiders are great because they're going to be feeding on the grasshoppers. Um, kestrels and other birds too, sometimes their population may spike up and down with a grasshopper infestation as well. And um, a lot of times people really love to watch the uh, praying mantids, especially as they are feeding on a grasshopper. Um, but this process may take two hours or more and then the mantids are done. So not like a huge um, benefit, but still interesting to watch. Um, we do not like the European paper wasp as much as we don't like earwigs and grasshoppers, but here are some paper wasps that have attacked um, grasshoppers at my house. And so I um, really appreciated seeing this, these um, wasps really doing this grasshopper in and just leaving a few little body parts behind. <laughs> All right, so in terms of managing grasshoppers, um, someone uh, wrote in through chat I saw that said that they uh, were seeing nymphs around. And so um, with grasshopper management, it's good to know the life stage that the grasshoppers are in on the site so that you're targeting um, or that so that what you're doing is going to have the best effect. So with organic um, and conventional, I'll show you in a sec, there are some baits. And these baits work best when the grasshoppers are uh, newly hatched. Um, and, and several weeks thereafter though, but before they get wings uh, is when you want to use a bait. So organic bait, this is called NOLO. So NOLO stands for Nosema locuste. It's a bacterium that um, as the grasshopper feeds, it affects the digestive system. The grasshopper becomes lethargic and um, the grasshopper that's affected can also spread that uh, Nosema to other grasshoppers as well. So I'll show a picture of that in a sec. 
Uh, and then if you're interested in, I just want to spray, uh, there's not a lot of organic options, but um, I already mentioned this as a diractin, similar to neem oil would be an option. And then the other bait that is for conventional is using carbaryl. Um, in the Nosema and the this carbaryl bait use a bran um, as the carrier. So they're both kind of shaken on the plant. So this eco bran, let me back up. The Nolo bait, you can get it at local farm stores. Okay. The eco brand, if that's something that you were interested in, you um, I haven't seen it locally in Utah, and so you would need to go online. I know there are a few companies that are selling it and shipping it to Utah. So just a final word on grasshoppers. Um, I mentioned these baits need to be applied when they're nymphs. Now, um, so someone had put in through chat that yes, they're still nymphs, so now is still a good time to do this. Um, I know that in Central Utah, where they are having that major outbreak, there are some that have formed wings. So if it's already that uh, stage, then it might be a waste of money to use the bait product. But this is what it looks like on the foliage. I mentioned it's in a bran uh, carrier, so it's just sprinkled on the plants and it's attractive to the uh, the nymphs, and they'll go feed on it and then and then uh, die. And, and if it's the nosema, this uh, is what the grasshopper might look like that has become infected. So that kind of concludes what I wanted to talk about with you guys. Um, I don't know if any other questions have come through, but I will uh, stop sharing. Yeah, I have a question. So I get a lot of questions from growers asking if they can use all purpose flour or like a baking flour as a bait. Is that effective or is that just kind of a myth? Um, from what I understand, it's kind of a myth. Um, I think the idea is more of a repellent or maybe it's disruptive to their exoskeleton or their cuticle. Um, but I, I know it's been tried in certain cases and not really found to be that successful. Okay. Awesome. So now we're going to switch gears and I'm going to talk about two different pests. I'm going to talk about first the potato leaf hopper. So the potato leaf hopper, there's two different species. We have the regular potato leaf hopper, which is the most common kind of found in the United States. And then there's kind of another subspecies, the Western potato leaf hopper, which we'll find predominantly in the Southwest. And I wanted to talk about this particular insect because I've been seeing a lot of them out recently, especially out on commercial farms. So they have a wide host range. There's about 200 wild and cultivated plants that these potato leaf hoppers can affect. And the adults will attack a lot more of these plants as opposed to the nymphs, the nymphs. And then the males actually have a wider host range than the females. So here in Utah, especially, and kind of potato leaf hoppers in general, they prefer beans, cow peas, potatoes, and alfalfa, which are mostly kind of agronomic crops, but a lot of home vegetable growers might be growing beans and potatoes as well. So they might have the same problems. And then there's um, a ton of various weed species too that can serve as a host for potato leaf hoppers. And these can include the pigweed, shepherd's purse, carpetweed, and pokeweed. And I listed the weeds on here as well especially in a garden setting, if you have a lot of weeds within your garden or a couple yards away from your garden, that can serve as an alternate host. So if you have those weeds, you can be attracting potato leaf hoppers or several other pests. So if you get rid of the weeds, you're reducing the host and you're just reducing hosts and the potential for them to come over to your vegetable crops. And then here in the middle, I listed some other common vegetables that you might find them on. So I've been seeing them on tomatoes, peppers, but mostly primarily just potatoes. Okay, so next I wanna talk about, whoops, the life cycle. 
So when the potato leaf hoppers, they lay their eggs, they lay them inside the veins or the petioles of the leaves. And these eggs are super tiny. They're about one millimeter long and they're kind of a transparent to a yellow color. And because they're in those petioles and veins, you're probably not gonna see them. And a female can lay up to 200 or 300 eggs within its lifetimes. And these eggs take about 10 days to hatch. So you can kind of see this graphic I have on the slide. Um, potato leaf hoppers, they develop through five instars. And an instar is basically kind of the life stage. So they'll grow, they'll kind of shed the exoskeleton and become bigger. And a lot of insect species develop through instars. And a potato leaf hopper particularly takes about eight to 25 days to develop through these five instars. So that, of course, just depends on the temperature and kind of the time of season. When potato leaf hoppers reach their full size, they're kind of a bright neon green. And they have these white spots kind of on their head. That's kind of a key way to identify them. And then I want to add there's hundreds and hundreds of leaf hopper species out there. So if you really want to be good at identifying them, you should collect them and use like a hand lens or even a microscope to kind of look at the specific head patterns and know which crop you're seeing them on. And leaf hoppers, the potato leaf hoppers particularly are really small. They're about 3 to 0.5 millimeters long. And the adults can live up to 30 to 60 days, just depending on the area. So here's some close-up images I have. This first one on the top left, if you look closely, you can see kind of those white markings on its head and kind of on its upper back. And then the top middle one shows a nymph. So especially when I go out in the field and I shake those plants in the and so, or the leafhoppers fall, I usually see a lot of nymphs because they're not fully developed yet. So they're not gonna be as mobile. They'll usually stick around on the plant. And you can kind of tell they don't really have the fully formed wings yet. And then on the top right, you can see the adult, or you can see kind of different instars of the potato leafhopper. And then the bottom middle one shows the potato leaf hopper on an alfalfa leaf. So you can kind of get that size comparison on how small these guys are. So let's talk about what kind of damage that these potato leaf hoppers cause. So both the nymphs and the adults, they're the ones that can cause damage with their mouth parts. And typically on potatoes, what I've seen is they'll feed mainly on the lower surface of the foliage. And then while they're feeding, they'll bite into these plant cells and they'll like inject kind of the toxic saliva they have. And that causes, and that kind of disrupts the phloem and xylem or the phloem and xylem flow within the leaves. So then that kind of reduces the browning on the sides of the leaves. So if you look in the top left picture I have, this is kind of the damage you'll see and they nickname it hopper burn. So again, this can reduce photosynthesis and kind of um, slow down the growth of potatoes. And all the damage is primarily on the foliage. You won't see any damage on the potatoes themselves, but with the photosynthesis or discoloration happening above, that can affect the growth of the potatoes. And the symptoms are usually first evident, like at the tips of the leaves, and then they kind of progress towards the whole leaves themselves. And the more leaf hoppers you have, the increased damage you will have with leaf injury. So this next picture, I kind of want to talk about um, the movement of leaf hoppers. So these are two separate farms that I frequently visit. The first one's up in Box Elder County, and it's kind of a small or kind of a small medium vegetable operation. And they're surrounded by an alfalfa field to the north and an alfalfa field to the south. So this is kind of an interesting location because these growers experience a lot of pest problems, though, especially because of that alfalfa production. So last year they experienced a lot of armyworms where the armyworms would migrate from the alfalfa. You could literally see thousands like crossing the street towards their vegetable crops. 
on both sides. And this year, particularly, the growers are have a big batch of potatoes. And we're seeing a lot of um, the potato leaf hoppers on their potato production. So I would go and I would kind of monitor the potatoes and then I would find a lot of leaf hoppers. But then afterwards, I'll walk out to, or I will go across the street into the alfalfa field and then I'll shake those plants too. And then again, I'll find a lot of potato leaf hoppers. So this is kind of a challenging situation for them. And then on the right side, I have another farm down in um, Utah County where it's kind of the same problem. They have potato production kind of going on in the middle, but to their north, south, and east, they have big fields of alfalfa. So I did the exact same thing where I found a lot of leaf hoppers um, within the potatoes. And then when I walked over to the alfalfa fields, I found the exact same things. But kind of an interesting thing between these two farms, one is organic. So they use row covers to protect their potatoes. And then on this farm on the right, they use a sauna spray for their potatoes and that kills a lot of the pests. So there's kind of an example, two different control methods. Um, this photo I took this morning, actually, this is at Gateway Community Garden. And this is kind of in the heart of downtown Salt Lake City. And this is a raised garden bed where they had, it was just kind of crammed full of potatoes. But just walking up to it, you could see these tiny little potato leaf hoppers just jumping around like crazy within these potatoes. And if you look closely at the photo, you can see a lot of what I was talking about with that hopper burn, where the leaves, where they'll feed on the leaves and the, start, the tips will start to brown and then eventually the whole leaf will turn brown as well. And then when I shook this foliage onto my tray, there's just at least a hundred little bright green potato leaf hoppers. So that was kind of cool to see. So to manage it, I think the best way for, whoops, the best, the best way for a small gardener would just to take like a hose and just high pressure spray your potato plants, especially if you only have like a few plants and that'll dislodge a lot of the nymphs. And then kind of like what we talked about earlier, using those floating row covers, if your timing's right, you could put those on covering your potatoes or other crops early in the season to prevent those leaf hoppers from migrating in towards the plants. And if you're a larger grower and you want to consider some chemical options, um, these are all kind of home options available for growers. The lithium products are registered for a variety of vegetable crops and especially potatoes, and, they'll, and they're specifically listed the control leaf hoppers as well. So there's some example of the lithium products. Um, Sven Valerate is another active ingredient used in Monterey Bug Buster. And then pyrethrins and sulfur, that's an organic product that we mentioned earlier that could be effective. And then of course, like insecticidal soap is a good option. So that's potato leaf hoppers. I'm going to check if we have any questions. Not through chat. Okay. On Facebook, we don't have any questions either. So I'm going to continue on. Give me one second. Marion, can you still see my PowerPoint? Yes, I see it, but it's not shown as a pre now it is. Okay, awesome. A question did come through. Um, okay. What you're describing for the potato leaf hopper, would that work for beet leaf hopper? Yep, absolutely. A lot of these um leaf hoppers, they're pretty much the same size. And if you look at I was like studying through a lot of the product labels earlier today. And a lot of them just listed simply as leaf hopper. So that can kind of indicate that they'll control beet leaf hoppers, potato leaf hoppers, and various other species. But again, always read the label and make sure it's first legal, second, that it's registered for the pest you're using it on, and third, it's okay to use on the specific crop that you're using. 
Okay, so next I want to talk about powdery mildew, specifically on cucurbits. So cucurbits includes our summer squash, our winter squash, cucumbers, zucchinis, pumpkins, um, melons, cantaloupes, stuff like that. So here in Utah, there's two fungal species that cause powdery mildew, and I have them listed up here. The second one, Potisparia xanthi, that's the most common one that we'll be seeing. So these are kind of microscopic images of what those fungi look like. So, whoops, powdery mildew, um, it overwinters in a fruiting structure on plant debris. And when the temperature is warm in the late spring, a secondary spore called the conidia forms and it will blow to leaf tissue and cause that infection. So unlike a lot of other fungi that we see in our garden, um, powdery mildew, um, it thrives in dry conditions, unlike, mo unlike moist conditions. Um, the ideal condition for infections are about two or more hours of high humidity, which we can see a lot of within cucurbit production. Infected tissues form more spores that can be blown in the wind to infect plants at new locations. And then the cycle of spore production, um, dissemination and infection occurs continually all summer long. So this bottom image I found kind of is like a close up. It's like a side view of powdery mildew. So on the bottom, you can see the plant cells and towards the middle where the fungi attaches to that upper layer, layer of the plants is the conidiospore. And then it kind of builds up those like little stringy um, conidiums of the fungi. And that's that white powder that we see on the leaf foliage. So when the temperatures cool down in the late summer, the fungus switches from producing those conidia spores to producing the fruiting structures that contain spores for the winter survival. So on the right side, I have kind of a cool image I found that shows kind of the disease cycle of powdery mildew. So here's some images. Um, these show kind of an advanced, or the, the, big, the two big ones show an advanced stage of powdery mildew. And then the bottom right one shows what powdery mildew looks like just starting off. So especially right now, you wanna go out into your gardens and look for these small little white um, powdery spots on your plants, cause you wanna, it's best to control it early. Cause the problem arises when the powdery mildew like these other two images covers the entire plant leaf that can affect the photosynthesis and the overall growth of your um, cucurbits. So especially, so again, like you wanna get out there right now and start looking for powdery mildew. So again, to manage monitoring, like I said, is super critical. Scout once a week or every day if you have the time. When you purchase your seeds or transplants, read the label. Sometimes they'll give you, they'll tell you that it has a higher resistance to powdery mildew, or it might have a lesser resistance to powdery mildew. So do the research on the variety that you're buying. Um, in the fall, it's super critical to remove the infected plant material and get it out of that site. So that way you're getting rid of those overwintering spores. And then when you're planting, you wanna increase the plant spacing. So that can help um, improve the airflow within the, the canopy and kind of reduce the chance of the spores spreading. For chemical control, a lot of sulfur products work very well. You wanna apply those when the white spots are first observed and then repeat applications every seven to 10 days. And then what, so, but if your leaves are covered entirely with powdery mildew, chemical controls probably won't be that effective. And don't apply sulfur products over 90 degrees and that, because that will cause plant injury. Okay, so now we're gonna do, if you joined us last time, I asked a lot of you guys to send in questions for Mary and I to look at. 